Hi, and welcome to episode 48 of the Breaking Bio Podcast. I'm Morgan Jackson, a PhD student at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. And today we've got another new guest, as always. But first, we'll introduce our other co-host. I'm Stephen Hamblin, postdoc at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. And as mentioned, our guest today is Dr. Zen Fox, who's an associate professor at the University of Texas, Pan American. So Zen, you want to say hi and tell us a little bit about yourself? Hello. I will say one thing, which is that, you know, we've got, you just introduce yourself as somebody in Canada and somebody in Australia, and I've been both those places, right? So I am actually a Canadian citizen, and I did a postdoc at the University of Melbourne. Um, and so Texas, where I am now, southern Texas, south until there is no more south to go to, Texas, is different yet again. <laughs> This is good, because Stephen's a Canadian, too, so this is just pretty much a big old Canuck fest, is what it, this is. It really is. So, we, I mean, as everyone's seen time. episode three of Captain Canuck, which just came out this week, and I'm very excited about it. I'm sorry, uh, I haven't. No. <laughs> we're, we're failing at this. I'm actually going to be blogging about Captain Canuck on the poster blog soon, oh. too. So. Awesome. I'm almost afraid to ask what Captain Canuck is. It, it, Captain Canuck is a Canadian superhero. There was actually, back in the 1970s, there was a short run of, of comics featuring this, this character. Um, I think it, he's been like revived a couple of times, but uh, his latest incarnation, there is a web series that has been funded through Indiegogo. They did a, a campaign, a crowdfunding campaign, and they've been... They're up to episode three. I think there's going to be at least one more. Um, and so they've, they've brought the character into the 21st century, and I'm, and I'm very excited about it. It's, it's, like, it's really fun. Oh, Wait, this was supposed to be the biology po podcast, right? It's like not the comics podcast. <laughs> oh, no. eh, we talk about whatever we want to talk about. <laughs> exactly. If we want to do half an hour on Captain Canuck, we're doing half an hour on Captain Canuck. Well, I, you know, I, one of the things... As I, you know, because you said we we're going to talk about design in this this episode, and one of the things that I do is that I blog about poster design, and I really do have a post coming up in the near future. So this is a little preview. Is I'm going to be talking about the redesign of Captain Canuck's costume, and the original costume was, you know, very much. You know, sort of the, the classic skin tight '70s kind of costume, and it's just it's the Canadian flag turned into a suit. Um, and the new costume, the question is, well, how do you keep how do you keep that character, bring it into something more contemporary, and yet still keep the you know the essential elements of the character, right? And, you know, you basically, you're working with the maple leaf, you're working with red and white, and all of these kinds of things. And I found a really nice interview with the person who designed it, and he was, was talking about how there's some things that he deliberately lifted from other captain, insert name of country here, right? <laughs> so he said he's deliberately picked up Rather than trying to recreate everything and do something completely different, he went in and he deliberately picked up some elements from Captain America, from Captain Britain, um, and put those into Canuck. And one of the things that I find really interesting with poster design is that a lot of times people want to do something different, just because it's different. And I think that one of the, the there's always this interesting tension between wanting to do something new and wanting and trying to keep with the old. And so I thought the Captain Canuck redesign was a really interesting example of that. Well, it just goes to show you can draw your inspiration for all sorts of things from elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is one of the things I talk about in, in the poster blog in particular is the idea is there is lessons everywhere. If you, you know, find something which is well made, well designed, you can think about that, it's like, okay, well, what is it about that that makes it tick? What is it about that that makes it work? Um, so on the blog, I have, you know, taken lessons from, well, I've got Captain Canuck coming up. Uh, some of my favorite posts are 
um, Lessons from Cosmo, Cosmopolitan Magazine, um, mm. Lessons from Lingerie, so I talked about bras one episode, uh, one week, <laughs> um, Highway Signs, and, and yes, okay, Cosmopolitan Magazine and the Lingerie, it's like, yeah, there's a guy writing the blog, all right? Um, <laughs> But it's legit. I, I, you can bring a good point. I mean, it doesn't matter where the good design comes from. As long as you've got good design and it, it's effective for what it's doing. Right. And, and thinking about, you know, uh, so there's been lots of cases like that where I'll, I'll take something that's like, okay, what is there to learn from this kind of object? Um, and how can you take what is there and apply that to making a scientific conference poster or, for that matter, anything else? Um, because a lot of the principles turn out to be kind of the same, and you can there's certain things that you can pick at and like run with when you're talking about like bringing uh, trying to make a good poster. You know the uh, the issue of design is something that's actually pretty dear to my heart. Um, I'm kind of the design guy around here. Okay. Uh, but one of the one of the things I find is that there's especially for people you know doing who are new like you know PhD students doing the first yes. poster or for the first right. talk, they they tend to have some fairly fundamental problems which go beyond you know the the more niceties of design. You know, sure. like well, the major thing know. is that they're amateurs, right? Yeah, and which, and the problem is that who are they being trained by? Other amateurs, because yeah. they're not being trained, you know, by people who are professional designers. I mean, I a lot of times I feel just guilty, guilty, guilty because it's like here I am writing the poster blog and. And I'm just another scientist. It's like <laughs> I didn't actually, you know, take design classes or art classes or any of this kind of stuff. I mean, there's a little bit of stuff that I learned way back as an undergraduate on a student newspaper, but I never, you know, sat down and, and uh, you know, I've taught myself a little bit. Like I'll go and, and occasionally I'll go and read some books and things like that. And I always kind of am, am looking for these kinds of things, but I've never had any sort of training or anything like that. And so I, I'm always wondering if I'm just like leading people down astray from the, the true path of design, because I don't know what I'm really doing either, I'm, but I'm just trying to you know, at least think about some of these things and, and you know try to get people to... Um, Think about some of the these kinds of issues. So, well, I have the at, virtue. At least, I'm, at least I'm wearing my amateur flag and not trying to hide it. <laughs> I, I have the the good fortune of being married to a, a fine artist. So, oh, I mean, I I have the benefit of that's good you know, inbreeding avoidance. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> first time I ever designed a poster, I was all proud of it, and it was in in my undergrad, and I. Spent hours on it, and then I showed it to her, and she went, "No, <laughs> you're not showing that in public." <laughs> so were there like 20 fonts and 15 colors? No, but I had just I'd done everything that I I thought you should do, you know, like I, I had everything, you know, very carefully centered, and there were you know were, there were the blocks of text in the boxes, and you know, and each each box had its own color, and it was it was. It was horrible. So, um, so you but, basically kind of dumped a, a a manuscript onto the page and then vomited color on it. <laughs> exactly, and actually, that's one of the things I find I find people do the most, which is if I mean, if I could get them to change one thing, it would be switching out of manuscript mode when writing a talk oh, God, or yes. a poster, right? Yeah. So many of them just take their their manuscript and go bleh, onto the <laughs> onto the slides. Yeah, absolutely, and and I'll give an I'll run with that for a second. Pet peeve, one of my biggest pet peeves, and some societies when they put in their instructions, they actually specifically ask for this, and it's stupid. Everybody who's listening to me, let anarchy reign, okay? Don't <laughs> do this. Ignore the instructions from your scientific society, and here's why: because there's no freaking poster police. Sometimes there should be. But there is nobody who's going to come and take down your poster, okay? And here's the pet peeve. It's people who put an abstract on their poster. Oh. <laughs> why? Oh. Oh, tell me why. Tell me why abstract poster putter honors. What are... 
are you hoping to accomplish besides just thinking that it looks more like a scientific manuscript, which a poster is not? Okay. Yeah. So here's oh, the thing: the abstract so is a summary. Abstract is a summary. So if an abstract makes perfect sense on a scientific manuscript when, in a lot of cases, you know, think about why you originally had abstracts because of indexing services like, you know, before there were things like PubMed and Google Scholar. I mean, even now, I mean, PubMed, right, shows you the abstract so that you can figure out in a glance, briefly, if you need to go read the full paper. Or you go back to even before PubMed when you had zoological records, psych abstracts, all of these indexing services that needed the short little abstract to summarize a paper so that then you could figure out if you physically needed to go into the library stacks to find the paper, right? Now, now you're at a poster. You're, it, it's like you have a summary of the thing that's right in front of you. <laughs> what is the point? It's like, oh, because it's just too much effort for me to look to my right? <laughs> and, and even worse, it's in the best spot on the poster. It's, the abstract is almost always people put it in the upper left corner, right? And again, so thinking about, well, this is one of the examples that I always use. If you go to a magazine that you see in a grocery supermarket, Okay. grocery store, like Cosmo, right? Every issue of Cosmo, if you go in there and you're like looking around and Cosmo, you're in the, has a minute, maybe, to convince you with your lettuce and your bacon and your ice cream and the ice cream is melting and you don't want the ice cream to melt, it has only a minute to say to you, hey, you, you in the checkout line, come over here. Yes, you, you come over here and read me, right? So every issue of Cosmo has a sex story. You know, 101 tips, ten, that was sex tips, and, and whether the sex tips are any good is kind of beside the point. But it's on the cover, right? And the, the, that thing to get your attention on the cover is always in the upper left corner. Why? Because that's where, when you are, if you are trained as an English reader, which most of you are, where do you always look to start reading on a page? You look in the upper left corner. That's the best spot on the poster. And... I can't believe that people spoil it by putting an abstract and because in some deep dark recess of their mind they kind of know it's a bad idea they put it in tiny teeny little type <laughs> and so you can't read it anyway unless you come up to it like six inches away with a magnifying glass <laughs> so people don't do that <laughs> okay <laughs> rant, cleansing breath in through the nose out through the mouth I think that was the best best rant we've had on the show yet, and the fact that it yeah. involved abstracts and Cosmopolitan magazine combined into one rant, awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, it actually it touches on a larger problem I face. You know, I've thought about posters for a long time because they're a very special informational problem, right? Yeah. Like I spend a lot of time on talks, and I feel like I've kind of kind of dialed those in. Yeah. But I mean, when it comes to posters, you have to convey such a a weird amount of information. In, in, as you say, this really constrained situation in which you have about two and, and a half seconds to get people in. And it's really, the thing that I find really fascinating is that the poster presentation is pretty much unique to academics. You know, mm. lots of people give PowerPoint talks. Lots of people give oral presentations in one way, shape, or form. I mean, that's really common, right? And so there's tons of books about how to give presentations and PowerPoint. You know, so there's Gar Reynolds, Nancy Duarte, and all of these people talking about like how to make great slide decks and how to work with that. And you look around for uh, the equivalent stuff and for posters, and there really isn't anything. And I think that it's primarily because the only people, you know, you go into business or anything else, um, maybe like some of the some things that like maybe in the medical or nursing professions or things like that which are kind of almost academic anyway um, or they certainly have ties to academia um, it's just not a format that you see anywhere else and I think that's one of the things which is kind of fun about doing the poster blog is that it is you know it's almost like you know a unique art form 
you know. Mm. Um, and so it's kind of interesting uh, to like look at that as something that only we do and only we have. Right. Yeah, I mean, I've seen some really nice posters, and one of the things is that, and this is, I think, one of the other things about the poster blog, and is that I've been really fortunate that people have given me a lot of submissions of things. And typically it's people who are like looking for feedback and critiques, which I'm, I'm happy to do. Um, so that's been one of the unexpected pleasures of doing that blog, is that it's really become a lot more reader-centered, because I get the people who are like sending me stuff, which is fabulous. Um, but one of the things, and I, I wrote about this at one point, is that there really isn't, you know, there are places where you can find posters, but there's not really um, a, a, something which is like the equivalent of the great presentations, right? So if you are looking for a great oral presentation, like a great, you know, people can immediately think of oh, well, why don't you watch like some of Steve Jobs' keynotes? Why don't you watch mm. some of the talks at TED? You know, Ken Robinson's talk at TED, I've seen probably four or five times, and it always holds up. Uh, you know, so there's all these examples of here's a really excellent presentation. That, and you can tell that when it resonates with people because you get the applause you, and you show it to, you know, I show these things in a classroom, and I can hear people respond, and I can see how it affects them, right? And so, and you go to, okay, well, so many cases of excellent design, what do you do? You look for good examples to base your work on, right? And with posters, I, I really feel like one of the things that's lacking right now is a place where there's like a bunch of examples, like a gallery of you know, 25 beautiful posters, conference posters, scientific conference posters. Um, and, I, and I sometimes like sort of ask people, it's like, hey, if you've got like examples of like things that you're really, really happy with, you know, send them my way. Um, but that, I think, would be something I would really like to see, whether it's on, on my blog or some other website or, some, or something like that. Um, and something that somebody sent me a little while ago, which was making me think about that, is that if you go into what everybody does, which is, it's like, okay, I want to look at posters. So I go to Google, and I type in excellent conference posters. And I go to Google Images, and I look at the, the results. And then I go in and type bad conference posters. <laughs> Surprisingly, there's very little difference between the two of them. <laughs> Mm. And again, probably part of that is because you're dealing with, you know, Google is primarily searching the text and they're not, you know, Google cannot make judgment about, like, what the images are or anything like that. But you look at them and it's like, oh, yeah, it's only when you really look at a poster up close that you can really start to pick apart, like, a good poster from a bad poster. Because so many of these things, when you scale it down into, like, the into like the little frame, the thumbnail that you get on a Google image result, you don't really, you can't really pick out what is something that's going to make a top-notch poster versus a crappy poster. Because at, at a distance, they can actually, and they can actually look kind of the same. Mm. But yeah, that's, that's something I've been thinking about, I've thought about before, and I, unfortunately I haven't thought, I haven't followed that up for a while, but I think that is something I would really like to see. Is like, I just like to you know create a gallery of twenty-five show-stopping posters. I would love that. You know, one of the more popular posts on my blog of all time is actually one entitled "Memoir of an, of an Academic Poster," in which I went through and from soup to nuts. When okay, so here's you know I'm starting at the very beginning with what am I doing, and I I re recounted. You know, step by step, how I actually created the poster, right? Including, you know, like timestamps. Like it took me, you know, two and a half hours to do this, and I did it this way. And I, I, has been. I think I may have seen that one. I think I may even have linked it on the poster blog. I can't remember off the top of my head, but that sounds familiar. But you know, I, I feel like there's a bit of a hunger for that, like because there's people out there kind of in the dark. They don't even know where to start. Like they don't know how to. Oh yeah, you know, absolutely. Even and I mean, that what was, software I to think... use or. Yeah, I mean, I've been. 
you know, I've been blogging and I do, you know, all kinds of stuff because I have ADD, apparently, scientifically. Um, you know, so I have like a crayfish blog. I have a, you know, my my main blog, Neuro Dojo. I have the poster blog. I have a movie review blog. I have, you know, I. Okay, hi, my name is Zen. I'm an etaholic. Um, <laughs> But it's it's really interesting because the poster blog, by a long way, has been my most successful project I, I online. And I think that it is precisely because what I found when I started that blog was I realized that there was an unfilled niche, that there really wasn't a lot of stuff out there and when I, and every time I sort of went looking for information, um, a lot of times, particularly when I went looking for books about scientific presentations and so forth, a lot of the information was like really dated. So it was talking about, you know, things like, well, you're going to have to pull out lecture set and rub down letters, and you know, it was <laughs> it really predated, you know, personal computing in a lot of cases. Um, <laughs> Um, so, I've got one question here, and yeah. and it's something that I don't know really gets covered at all, um, by at least by departments and and pros teaching. It seems that everybody defaults to poster, and then unless unless they're like super uh, outgoing, and then they might do presentations. Mm -hmm. Do you think that some science should never ever ever be presented in poster form? It, it's better suited for for you know vocal presentation. Ooh. That's a tough one. Now, from my own background in things like animal behavior, one of the things that is great because I'm old, okay, <laughs> and I rem you know I think I have back here. Oh, I let me see. Let me see. Um, okay, people, I'm about to show you my old man cred here to prove that I'm really old. This is something that some of you may never have seen. This is a 35 millimeter photographic slide and I'm gonna go one step further to show you how old I am. One second. <laughs> if you're listening live you can find these, these old relics uh, online by searching 35 go. millimeter slide. 35 millimeter slide, and what you would do is you would put them in one of these. <laughs> yes, I hey. still have a 35 millimeter slide carousel. And you would put I've got you beat. Here. I actually, I've shot not only shot 35 mil slide, I actually developed it by hand. So you could. So did I. <laughs> Black and white, baby. So yes. Oh, I know. I, I did color. I did E6. Or are you a purist? You're like the person who won't buy music on CD because vinyl sounds warmer. <laughs> Oh God, no! Just one upon a time, I thought I was going to be a photographer, and they made me do it. <laughs> um, okay, so so, but yeah, I mean, so thirty-five millimeter slides, right? And this was this was my graduate degree, pretty much. It was, and even when I gave a job talk, when I, I got this job, I came in at, with both PowerPoint and a rack of 35 millimeter slides just in case because that was kind of the transition point. So yeah, I'm old. Um, and one of the great things now is that if you've got video, and which in animal behavior is something that you almost always have, you know, you it, because it took a long time for video to get you enough bandwidth to get like something where you could actually Come in with a like a slot, a presentation, like a, a oral presentation, and show video of something. And and I'm still stuck in a lot of cases with at a poster where it's like I really want to show a video because there's nothing like actually watching the behavior of the animals. And so I've you know provoked proposed a lot of hacks for that. Sometimes I've just taken a couple of years ago. The reason, the whole reason I bought an iPad, the sense, the the excuse that I had to buy an iPad was so that I could use it to show videos at a conference, uh, on a poster. So I basically tacked up my iPad on the poster. 
and it worked. It worked really well. Yeah. But other times when I didn't have before I had the iPad was I would just put like a link to a YouTube video and I would have like a QR code um, so mm. that people could if they had a smartphone with them they could scan the code and then they could watch the video and that actually worked not badly um, so I've done that a couple of times but if you've got something where there's video and that turns out to be really critical to the story that you're trying to tell that is one thing that is really hard to do on a poster. In you know, there's there's ways that you can do it, but honestly, in a lot of those cases, it is just better, I think, to just try to get the slot where you can show the actual video rather than doing like frame grabs or like all these other kinds of hacks. And there's probably other cases as well. Um, one of the interesting things is because I've, I've surveyed the blog readers a few times. And everybody actually, pref or not everybody, most people, the majority of people prefer giving an oral presentation and they prefer listening to an oral presentation over a poster. And the issue is that most people end up doing a poster because it's a less high risk kind of situation. Um, you can have somebody who can give a poster and it's you know, it's done in advance and once you have a piece of paper okay uh, if you've got like a four by eight foot piece of paper a lot of things can happen to it but it's probably not gonna malfunction okay? <laughs> it's not going to crash you're not going to have like the font suddenly change on you you're not going to have like somebody go oh I have a Mac and now uh, and now I can't read your poster, so I need like the proper Mac video adapter cable or anything like that. It's like it's really hard to screw up a poster once it's printed, right? <laughs> and it's and it's so in that kind of situation, you've got something which is a little less high risk than um, than an actual present than an oral presentation. Um, so there's reason, you know, a lot of the reasons. It's, it's interesting to me that a lot of people default because they go, well, that's a good starting point because so many people have stage fright, so many people have other kinds of issues um, with with trying to do um, a good oral presentation. You know, a, a good oral presentation is a little bit more high risk, high reward too, but it's not as um, a poster is. There's a few more safety nets in giving a poster, I think. Yeah. I think that's why we see a lot of people's first meetings doing the posters and then uh, realizing that yeah. presentations are where it's at. So, <laughs> All right. Well, unfortunately, we're pretty much out of time here for, for this episode, but I think we're going to have to get you back on another time to, uh, to talk about stuff, your research, and, and various other bits of science. Because, uh, like you said, you're all over the place and lots of interesting things to talk about. Until well, I, then... I, Oh, go ahead. I've just I've had a great time ranting about posters, so <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. No problem. This is a, an excellent episode for a lot of people. I think a lot of people glean more information. So if people want more information further than what we could cover in this half an hour, where would be the best place that they can find you online? You said that you're at a lot of places, but perhaps how can they track you down and learn more about posters and about your work? Probably the one-stop shop is drzen.net. And Dr. Zen is kind of my online identity. So fortunately, I have an, you know, an unusual name. So it's, I'm fairly easy to find online. Um, and similarly, Dr. Zen is also my Twitter handle. And since we've been talking specifically about posters, if people want to try to find the poster blog, it is betterposters.blogspot.com. And I'm pretty sure that if you just type in better posters, you will probably find my blog. Or at least some good representation of a I better poster. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again for coming on the show. And if anybody's listening at home and wants to find us, you can find us on Twitter at BreakingBio, or you can find the blog with all of our past episodes at BreakingBio.com. And you can also find us on Facebook by searching for the Breaking Bio podcast. So we want to say thanks to Dr. Zen, and for all of you non-Canadians out there, start making better posters. Thanks. <laughs>